Good morning, Emmanuel, and we are ready for a brand new series, our first series of 2021 in God We Trust. And no, we're not being reactionary. This was planned a long time ago. Little did we know that we would really need to live by that moniker. Who do we trust in this season, church? Do we trust ourselves? Do we trust the chaos in the culture? Hopefully not. Or are we going to trust God? That is going to be the big question through this series. We're going to talk about worldviews. We're going to talk about subjects that are staring followers of Christ in the face. Now, whether you are a follower of Christ or whether you are somebody that's checking the church out or you don't know where you're at, this is a perfect series to jump into because we want to get real with the things that are confronting people of faith. And we thought, what a better way to start off this series uh, with uh, a friend of mine, uh, one that has, uh, has been, I guess, a, a lead singer of a, a particular group called Skillet. Is that a new group? I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, anyway, no, they've been all over the place. If you don't know who they are, uh, I don't know where you've been at, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Maybe some of you don't. It's, they're hard rock, right? So, but uh, they, they're played on secular radio stations, Christian radio stations. They're played in movies, wrestling, sports, you name it. And so uh, we're just happy to have him here today. But re- particularly where we really connect is his heart for the Lord, and also he has a podcast called the Cooper Stuff Podcast that's really been hitting the things of this culture right now. So without further ado, I just want to bring up, and let's give a big Emmanuel welcome to John Cooper. How's it going? You can tell that I don't speak at church as much or I would have covered up my Battlestar Galactica emblem here. <laughs> it's insight to me that you probably don't want to know. I fell in love with Battlestar Galactica in 1978. Some things never change. <clears throat> I love what uh, Andy said a second ago at the end of worship, right? That we are following a Lord... And it doesn't matter what's happening in the capital, we're following the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what happens in politics, it doesn't matter what happens at your kids' schools, it doesn't even matter what happens at your jobs, we're following the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is the truth. And we're going to talk about truth today. I think that we're in such a volatile time, mainly because we do not agree on what truth is. So I'm glad to be here. My name is John Cooper, and uh, as I already said, in a uh, long distant past for a job, I used to play, con. there's these things called concerts. I don't know if you guys remember what concerts are, but people would get together and have fun while a band played music. Those are called concerts. I always wonder if it's going to be like war stories, like to our grandkids, and they'll be like, people used to get together in crowds? Yeah, it was awesome. (laughs) It was good, it was good, it was good. For 23 years, we have been traveling around the world, um, playing roughly 120 concerts a year, sometimes 140, a busy year, 150. Our busiest years, 200 concerts a year. For 23 years, along with my wife over here, Corey, and... uh, up until March of last year, and everything has obviously changed. And um, these are my kids sitting right here, too. Say, hey, what's up? <laughs> We've traveled all the way around the world. And what I want to share with you guys is this, that we are going through a volatile time in America, right? But I'm not just talking about pandemics, not just talking about our particular form of politics. We are going through a cultural philosophy shift that is changing the way that everybody in our nation thinks. Here's what I want you to know. This is not uniquely American. This is happening all over the globe. Everywhere that we have been, there is a shift globally in the way that the world views truth. You mark my words, in 20 or 30 years, I believe that historians will look back and they will say the 2010s was when there was a shift in thought. We see that with the Enlightenment and other periods of history, right? When the world all kind of, a tipping point happened when the majority of culture began to view truth or reason in a different way. I believe we're in that time right now. 
I wrote a book about it. I wrote it in 13 different countries. It is called Awake and Alive to Truth because it was such a bizarre phenomenon to me that I said, this isn't just America, this is everywhere. And I've called this sermon Awake and Alive to Truth as well. One of the things that I do not like about traveling is jet lag. And my kids can attest to this because they make fun of me. I cannot get used to when I fly to Europe. It takes me about three weeks. And I cannot sleep. So it feels like I'm staying up all night long and playing a concert at 5 a.m. And then I finally get to sleep at what feels like 8 a.m. But you know how some people can do that and then they sleep for like 12 hours? I sleep for like two, and my body's like, it's time to get up. It doesn't matter how much sleep I got. When it's time to get up, it's time to get up. And I get in this cycle that I cannot sleep, and it ruins my life. And my kids make fun of me because throughout their time in Europe, we could be at a restaurant, and I just fall asleep. At 5 p.m., we're at a restaurant. We're talking. Next time, I'm like. (laughs) And it's become a big joke. Dad fell asleep again. And, and, and everybody's learned that they have to wake me up quietly. So Corey's like, John, John. Because I get freaked out. I'll be like, what? Where am I? Right? It's a joke with the kids, isn't it? I fall asleep in the dressing room. I fall asleep in the airport. I fall asleep at the restaurant. I am so tired, and I wake up, and I scream, where am I? How did I get here? It's true. My question is this. Have you guys felt that question arise over the recent years? Have you asked yourself that question? When you hear what your kids are learning at school, when you read someone that you thought you were really good friends with, when you read their Facebook post and you find out what they really believe and you had no idea that's what they believed, do you find yourself saying, where am I and how did we get here? Have you guys lost Christian friends in the last couple of years? I have. I've lost Christian friends that I never, ever thought would ever stop following Jesus Christ. You know those friends that you make when you first either come into the faith or when you come and you get serious with God or you have kids and the other friends have kids and then you become friends and you think we are going to be serving the Lord for the rest of our lives and you never expect those friends to become enemies of Christ. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Or when you see your friends decide that they don't want to be married anymore. They want to have a new, younger spouse. Has that happened to you guys? That's happened to me in the last few years. People that I never thought. Seeing some of my friends leave their wives and kids for their new soulmate. Somebody said to me, yeah, but I feel like this new woman is actually who God wanted me to be with. Where are we, and how did we get here? Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27. I've got great news for you guys. If you feel the whole world has gotten a little chaotic, we've got good news because there is a way out of the chaos, and it is found in the truth of Jesus Christ. Let's see what Jesus has to say. Jesus says there's two kinds of people, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you speak to us today. I thank you that you are the truth. I thank you that you have led us out of chaos and into your glorious kingdom. As we sang earlier today, I am so thankful that we have been set free from the slavery of sin and death because of your death on the cross, Jesus Christ. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you move today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Jesus says this, if you build your lives on my words, then you'll be unshakable. Do you feel unshakable in 2021? 
If there's any word I could use to describe our culture, unshakable does not come to mind. We are in a time that is more volatile, certainly, than, than I've ever seen in my lifetime. My grandmother's 93. I asked her, have you ever seen it this volatile before? She lived through World War II. She was married during World War II. She's old. <laughs> and she said, John, I, for all the Lord Jesus, I tell you, I've never seen anything like it. That's how she talks. I thought you might laugh. Let's move on. It's just weird. That's what she says, doesn't she, Corey? It's just weird. I hope she's watching. We're living in a volatile time, the likes of which I have never seen. Let me ask you this, especially for parents here or people who are, you know, older than parents. In the last decade, have you noticed that people are using words and terminology that you've never heard before? Right? She's sharing her truth. She's taking back her power. They're speaking truth to power, oppression, systemic injustice. Here's my guess. I bet that you guys are like me. I bet that for a time you thought it's just because you were getting old. Guess what? We are. But it's not because you're getting old. It's because culture is shifting at such a fast degree because of the internet and social media. It is happening so fast. It's not just because you're old and this is young people talk. There are brand new philosophies interjected into everything that happens. Plus, there's another thing that used to not be, be the case. Listen to this. There is a moralistic self-righteousness Attached to every media report, every protest, every incident, every political agenda, every classroom, every social media post that demands absolute conformity to a particular belief. But it has no consistency in its beliefs. It demands absolute conformity. The most virtuous thing you can do right now in 2021 in atheist, secularist culture, the most virtuous thing you can do is follow the science. And it don't matter that the science changes tomorrow or the next day. It doesn't matter if you follow the science and it ended up hurting people. You're still going to be looked at as virtuous because there's nothing better than following the science. Almost a year ago today, literally, the World Health Organization said, hey, there's no Human-to-human -human transmission of COVID-19. That did not age very well. <laughs> Has anybody apologized? No. Why? Because following the science is virtuous, and it doesn't matter if it's true. It feels true. We were told we have to wear a mask. Dr. Fauci comes on a month later. You don't even need to wear a mask. He says, why are you wearing a mask? We don't need to be doing that, guys. Two months later, you're a bad person if you're not wearing a mask. Nobody ever went back and said, sorry, we were wrong about that one. It doesn't matter. You follow the science or you are immoral. Lock down, don't lock down. Don't go to church, but you can go to a protest. Can't get cancer treatment in April, but we need to make sure we have justice for people who need abortions. You can get an abortion, but you can't go to church to worship God. And guess what else we found out? Half the preachers in America agreed we don't need to go to church. We are breaking the second commandment of Christ to love your neighbors yourself if you go to church. Can't sing at church, you can scream at a protest. California actually had a court decision. You can't go to church, but we have to keep strip clubs open. You can go to a strip club and you can drink a Jack and Coke. You can't go to church and eat the bread and drink the wine. This really upsets me. What is the deal? We're also told now that we have to believe anything a woman says. I know this is going to make some people mad here. Hashtag believe women. This is not me being political partisan. I could care less about Brett Kavanaugh. I have no opinion, don't care. Don't, doesn't matter to me. I want to talk about the principle. Are you saying that if a woman says something, it must be believed no matter what? Believe her truth. You guys remember that? 
It's confusing stuff, wasn't it? I remember watching it thinking, believe her truth. You're telling me no matter what she says, it has to be believed, or else I'm a sexist? Where is all this coming from? Is there anything that is true? John 14, 6. We all know this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to read it again, but I want to put the emphasis on a different word. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. Well, that just sounds offensive. That sounds not very inclusive, right? I am the life. You have to understand when Jesus says, I am the truth, what Jesus is saying, there is a presupposition that what you are seeing with your eyes is actually real. That there is a system that has been created and there is a truth behind that creation that pre-existed and ordained and ordered the very world that you are seeing. And Jesus is saying, that was me. Well, what happens if we don't believe that there actually is a reality that we are seeing? Part of what he's saying is this, is that I am the truth. There is an understanding. There is a way to salvation. There is a path to follow. And that truth is fixed. It is immovable. It is absolutely pure, both in its truthfulness and its holiness. It's a truth that contains absolutely no deception, no darkness, 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Well, that's what Jesus says means that truth is, right? Well, then why is this so much more confusing now than it was? I want to jump from scripture into a tiny bit of philosophy. Are you guys ready for a little bit of philosophy to understand the world? If we're going to understand what the world means when they talk about truth, we have to talk about a few philosophical things. We have to trace back to the 1960s. The 1960s was a period of revolution. Amazing revolutionary music came out of the 60s. <laughs> right? You say you want a revolution. Well, you know. Oh, my gosh. I wish I wrote that. We all want to change the world. You know that one, don't you? Woo! Anti-establishment revolution. People wanted to change the world in the 60s. Rebellion. Some positive things happened in the 60s, by the way. Civil rights movement. Civil disobedience. But a lot of bad stuff happened in the 60s. And the work of the revolution is not done. We have to mention that. We'll get to it. One of the things that was popularized in the 60s was postmodernism. Postmodernism is really hard to explain, and I'm not even smart enough to explain it. So let me just try to do the best I can. Extremely abstract. It is by nature unorthodox. It is by nature deconstructionist. It is against the, the, the age of reason that says that we look out in the world and we see the grass is green, and we want to find out why the grass is green. Postmodernism deconstructs that and it says, how do you even know that's grass? How do you know that that color that you say green, that I'm seeing the same green that you're seeing? It's not necessary. We don't know that that's the same thing. Do you understand the difference between those two worlds? In other words, there, there really isn't any truth. If there is absolute truth, we could never attain it anyway. We couldn't grab it. Even if we saw it, we wouldn't know that we were perceiving it correctly. So there is no absolute truth. If there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute reality. If there's no absolute reality, then there's no absolute morality. Agreed? It is deconstruction. Well, how do you know that? You know, the best way to describe postmodernism is this. I want you to pretend you're watching a movie with a bunch of dumb frat boys staying up all night drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. And one of them says, man, what if, like, we're not even, like, here? And what if, what if we're going to wake up and find out that we're actually in the dream now, but when we wake up, we're actually robots. And we're robots that don't know how to feel, so we programmed ourselves to feel that's postmodernism. 
It's made for people to sit around and say completely wacky stuff about. It makes for awesome science fiction films like The Matrix. Inception. These are postmodern films. Deconstruction. Postmodernism teaches that there is no absolute truth, and that means there is no absolute reality. Understand this. Nobody actually fully believes in postmodernism. All you have to do is walk up to them and slap them in the face. And if they say, why did you slap me in the face? You say, that's not a face. It's a balloon. Nobody actually believes fully in postmodernism. But through the years, postmodernism, you got to imagine on a computer screen, here's postmodernism, and on a computer screen, there's all these various different philosophies up here, and people have been grabbing them like with a mouse. You grab the, the, your computer mouse, you grab it, you drag it down to postmodernism, doesn't work, trash. You grab a new one, it works, it grows bigger into a brand new monster. Understand this, this is how postmodernism sees truth, because the question is, then if nothing is true, then why do we all kind of agree that grass is green? Why do we kind of agree that two plus two equals four? Postmodernism basically says this. It happens because majority culture has a perception of reality. It's not absolute. It is a perception. It's the way that you see things, the way that you want the world to be, and majority culture presses down all of their opinions on all the people under them. In a way, they're not just pressing down, they are oppressing people under them. And not only are they making the people under them that are the oppressed, not only are they making the oppressed live by a perception of reality that those people believe in, they actually have the arrogance to call it truth. Does that make sense? It's not truth. It's just the way that they think the world should be. And they are trying to make us all fall into line. Another thing that you have to understand about this is this philosophy of power dynamics. The idea of power dynamics that is alive and well right now that your kids are being taught at school, whether you know it or not. Whether, your kids aren't going to understand why. They're just learning this. It is a zero-sum game of power dynamics. It means this. Whoever has power has it because they stole it from someone else. We aren't, we aren't working together. We are no longer in conflict. Men have power. Why? They steal it from women. White people have power. Why? They steal it from black people. Heterosexuals have power because they steal it from homosexuals. So on and so forth. Does that make sense? So what does this do? That make, gives you an idea of who the oppressors are, the patriarchy, whiteness, heterosexuals, Christianity. We are the oppressors. We are bad. Everybody else is the oppressed in varying levels. So now it separ actually separates into who is guilty and who is not guilty. That is why... I'm sure a lot of people here have heard the term identity politics. Postmodernism gave birth to identity politics. Why? Because identity politics is the way that postmodernism outworks into activism to change reality. So I know people are saying, what in God's name does this have to do with the gospel? It's going to have a lot to do with the gospel in 2021. You break everybody into groups, into identity groups, white people, black people, girls, uh, men, homosexuals, heterosexuals, Christians, atheists, and you go down the list so you can decide who is guilty and who is innocent. Here's how I'm going to define truth. If you want to know how your kids view truth today, if you want to know why when you turn on social media, or turn on the news and you hear stuff that you're like, what in God's name are they actually talking about? This is the way that I define truth today. Are you ready? The world the way I think it should be. John Piper has a slightly different definition than me, if you want to throw that up there for me. He says, people are trying to experience life to the full. And they call this experience truth for them. Not absolute truth, just truth for them. 
life to the full the way I think that the world should be. Why is this? You have to understand this. Majority cultures, as we call it, the, the oppressors, the oppressors have lost all of their moral authority. Why? Because they are oppressing people. And if you are one of the oppressed groups of people, as defined not by you as an individual, but you as a group, then you actually have access to what some people call life experience. Have you heard that on the news before? We need to hear her experience of truth. What that means is that people in groups, women have an experience that gives them secret knowledge or secret truth that a man cannot have. Minority cultures have secret truth that white culture cannot have. That is what they mean when they say, believe her truth. It's not just a fancy way of saying it. So the question you might want to ask yourself then is, well, then why are there so many rich white men all saying all the same stuff? This is so important. Why are the richest people in America the ones saying these things, like Bill Gates and people that own Twitter and the people that own Facebook? Why are they the ones saying all this? It is because of this. The only way you can gain moral authority back is by admitting you have none. That's what virtue signaling is. Some people are saying, this is way too academic. I don't really care. I don't know how this has to do with something. I, uh, can you throw this article from reason.com up here? Let me tell you why it matters. This is the world that we are living in and your kids are being raised in. An article in reason.com in September, Seattle public schools will start to teach that math is oppressive. A new ethnic studies curriculum will teach students that ancient mathematical knowledge has been appropriated by Western culture. Math is a deeply frustrating subject for many elementary and high school students, but Seattle public schools are gearing up to accuse math of a litany of more serious crimes, imperialism, dehumanization, oppression of marginalized persons. The district has proposed a new social justice infused curriculum that would focus on power and oppression and history of resistance and liberation. The guidance says it will rehumanize mathematics through what? Experiential learning. Experiential learning doesn't mean that some people understand objective math better. It means, well, they might have a different view because they have been marginalized and we have no moral authority. So maybe two plus two does equal five. You think I'm joking, don't you? Let's turn to the next one, Harvard. Let's see what Harvard has to say about it. An article entitled, Kareem Carr Explains Why 2 Plus 2 Equals 5, came out last September, a few months ago, in harvard.edu. PhD student Kareem Carr's productive Twitter dialogue about the abstract nature of mathematics was recently profiled by Popular Mechanics in an article entitled, Why Some People Think 2 Plus 2 Equals 5 and Why They Are Right. After seeing the impact of both the online dialogue and the recent article, Carr's hope is that you understand the flexible relationship between our mathematical systems, our perceptions of the world, and the symbolic manipulations we use to reason about reality. If you want to read more about that, all you got to do is Google math is oppressive, and you will be shocked. I know this sounds silly, but it kind of matters, doesn't it? If we were to talk about truth in any sort of way that has anything to do with practical life, pragmatically, I think it matters. How about I give you another example that matters more? There is a rapid onset condition that is happening all over the world, you guys, amongst teenage girls. It's happening in America mainly, I shouldn't say mainly, I should say mostly, in California. It is a condition that is causing bodily malformations that need to be removed. The problem is that California's Department of Insurance has not demanded that insurance companies cover these surgeries until girls are 18. What are these malformations that these girls are suffering from? Breasts, their own breasts. Press release came out last month. The Department of Insurance finds that applying strict age limits in health insurance for double hysterectomy surgery 
is impermissible under California law. It is unjust to not let 14-year-old girls who believe that they are boys to have double hysterectomies. It is an injustice. This is what the world means when they talk about oppression. Those girls are being oppressed by majority culture that is telling them that biological reality is real. That's pretty dark, isn't it? Where am I? And how did I get here? Let's look at John 14, 6 again. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is a simple scripture. You can't misunderstand this scripture unless you view truth the way our culture views truth. Do you understand what I mean? If you, if you view that scripture through the way the culture says it, then all that Jesus is saying is, is that I am the way and I am like, kind of like the world the way you want it to be. I am the way and I am life to the fullest. Does that sound familiar to you guys? I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. I believe that that is part of why we are seeing the deconstructionist movement in Christianity that we are seeing today. People want to serve a Jesus that they would prefer rather than the Jesus of the Bible. He's the way and he's the way that I want the world to be and he ever lives to make me happy. But as we already heard this morning, he has to be Lord People want the benefits of the kingdom of God with the caveat that they themselves will be the king. Deconstructionism within, deconstructionism within Christianity does the exact same thing as postmodernism. You guys know that deconstructionism is part of postmodernism. Without, without deconstructionism, postmodernism doesn't make sense. We're doing the same thing. So now we're going to deconstruct all of Christianity and say, I don't really think that's what the Bible says. I just think it was majority culture that pressed it on me. This is how you interpret the Bible. This is how you interpret the Bible. This is what the Bible says about sexual morality. This is what it says about being faithful to your spouse. This is what it says about the father's authority in a home. Woo, hello. Hello. It kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? I call it postmodern Christianity. It seems, let me give you some of the things. I'm just going to read some of these things. How about this? Tell me this sounds familiar. That might be what you think the Bible means, but that's not my interpretation. That might be what you think it means because you've been brainwashed by majority culture. That might be what you think it means, but there's a million different ways to interpret the Bible. The Jesus that I know would never tell somebody how to live on their sexual preferences. The Jesus that I know would never send anybody to hell. That's not the Jesus I know. I've heard it so many times. I finally come to agree with my deconstructionist friends. You're right. The God of the Bible is not the Jesus that you know. It's not the Jesus that you know. It sounds confusing. It sounds academic. But it all comes back down to good old-fashioned idolatry. It's no different than even the garden. Did God really say? It's the same thing. We all want to be God. We all want to be God. We won't turn there, but let's go back to the scripture we started with. Jesus says, there's two kinds of people. You can build your life on the sand, and it's going to get washed away. you can be thrown to and fro on every wave of doctrine. Does that sound like 2020? So far, it sounds like 2021. Or you can build your life on my words on the rock, and you will be unshakable. Because my word never changes. Because I am the truth, not a version of truth, not the Jesus you want me to be. I am actually the Jesus who I say I am. Can I, we won't turn there, but can I give you some food for thought? 
This scripture that I'm talking about in Matthew about building your house on the sand, four verses before it, there's a passage of scripture that most all of us know really well. It's that verse that says, where Jesus says, many, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I did this, I did this, I this. And Jesus is like, I don't know who you are. You know what the connection that we don't make? You know what the very next verse after Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I don't know you. You know what the next verse is? There are people that hear my words but don't act on them. And they are like the people who build their house on the sand. Why am I saying that? Because for so many years, I always thought that that meant that there are unbelievers who build their house on the sand. I think that Jesus is saying, no, no, there are people who believe my words, yet they don't act on them. And they build their house on, a sa- on the sand. That's kind of frightening, actually, isn't it? That's worth reading. Maybe I'm wrong. That's what Matthew, Matthew Henry agrees, and, and, he, and, and I like Matthew Henry, so I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> There are people that say, I hear the words of Jesus. I even believe that they're actually true. I even cast out demons in his name, but I never built my life upon his words. Does that sound anything familiar like the amount of Christians that we meet constantly now who say, oh, I'm totally into Jesus. I just don't really believe the Bible. It's madness. It's like saying, Oh, I'm really into a dictator. And somebody's saying, whoa, that dictator killed a million people. And like, well, I don't like that part. I don't believe what he did, but I'm into the dictator in general. He always looks good on a t-shirt, doesn't he? <laughs> it's kind of making fun of young people, isn't it? Like wear a shirt where they have no idea what it is. Che Guevara. You do, right? It's always like that, isn't it? Yeah, you're like, yes. Yeah, Killed a lot, of, a lot of people, if that matters. I'm not into that part. It's madness to say you're into something without understanding the thing that you're into unless you don't believe that truth is absolute. To follow Christ means rejecting this new worldview. And I just want to say it one more time in case. I know that some of us, I was talking to a friend recently. He's like, John, I hear you. But all this stuff is so academic, I don't think that people would ever believe that worldview. And I said, no, no, listen. People already believe that worldview. They, they, I don't think they understand it. I'm not saying they, believe, they understand postmodernism and, and relativism and critical theories. I'm not saying they understand power dynamics, but this is the worldview that they believe. Just like a four-year-old doesn't know why the sun comes up, but they know it's going to be there tomorrow morning, right? They know it's hot. They don't really know why it's hot. This is the worldview that your kids are being raised in and it needs to be noticed and it needs to be rejected because you cannot follow Jesus as the only truth if there is no such thing as the only truth. But this is great news for us believers. I'll tell you why it's great news for us believers. Because in a world that is experiencing the amount of chaos that they are, we will begin to stand out. We will begin to stand out because we're not in all the chaos. We understand what truth is. And it is great news for people who don't know Jesus Christ this morning or maybe who are listening online because Jesus offers a way. He's the way, right? He offers a way, the way, to heaven. He is the truth, not the truth the way you want him to be. He is the truth the way he says he is. He is who he says he is, which means that you can trust him. And he is the life, and that's the most important thing. Because a lot of people don't know that if you don't know Jesus Christ, that you are a walking dead person. The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses. That's how you come into this world. You are born into sin. You are against God. You're just like me. You're just like Andy. You're just like Eve. You wanted to be your own God. But Jesus offers life. Final scripture, Romans 6, 23. 
for the wages of sin is death. You guys know what that means? When I was a kid, I, I, I knew the scripture but didn't understand it. Here's what it means. It's like you've been working, you've been working, you've been working. I'm ready for my wages, death. Right? Working all day long, I'm ready to get what I deserve, death. That's what you deserve. The Jesus I know would never send somebody to hell. That's what you and me deserve. That's why Jesus suffered on the cross. In your place. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know what that means? You don't work and work and work and work, ready to get what I deserve, life. That's not what it means. You work and you work and you work and you work. If you want what you deserve, you deserve hell and punishment, just like me. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to invite you this morning, if you do not know Christ, to understand that you are building your life upon the sand. And you are headed for destruction, just like I was, just like Andy was, just like my wife, Corey, over there, just like everybody. Headed for destruction. But Jesus Christ has made a way through the cross. Repent for your sins. Repent for wanting to be your own God. Repent for not trusting God's words. Repent for not upholding his laws. Come awake to his ways and his goodness. Come alive to his spirit and build your life upon the rock of Jesus Christ this morning. Why don't we pray? And then I think Andy's gonna come up. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the cross that has set us free from the power of sin and death. And we thank you that we don't have to work for salvation because we could never earn it, but that you have given us a free gift. It is so wonderful to know you. Thank you that you are the anchor in the storm that we are in the middle of, headed now into 2021, possibly into greater storms, that you never fail us, and for anyone listening and watching who doesn't know you, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would convict their hearts this morning. Convict their hearts to repent and to fall in line with your ways. In Jesus' great and holy name, amen. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, John. Right. Let's give it up for John right. this morning. Stay here. And by the way, if you uh, gave your life to Christ this morning, we'd love to know. We'd love for you to be able to share with you your next steps in your faith. You can go to Kenosha.Church uh, and on the Connect card, just go, or just click that box that you uh, gave your life to Christ today or rededicated your life. Uh, that would be great for us just to help you walk uh, in this newfound life. We love when people give their life to Christ. Amen. John, thank you so much for today. Very convicting. And, you know, I know even when I start to squirrel, that means uh, truth is hitting the heart where it, it's not that even, like, you would disagree with it. It's you realize this is real. We've hit a fault line. And I think right now in society, we are in a fault line. I mean, just even, uh, even in our picture here, and this is like, uh, these are all just real headlines. I saw the murder hornets. I forgot about that. That would be a top story in a regular year. But, uh, um, but, you know, when it comes to just what we are navigating, people are tense, typically speaking, because we want we, we want to be at peace. You know, we, we don't, most normal people don't want to fight. If you do, you need to seek help for that, all right? So, but, uh, uh, but the thing is, this year is going to be, whether we like it or not, we're going to be walking into this. And one of the things that you just really uh, just caught me here is that you dealt with a lot of topics this morning uh, that could so easily, people hear these topics, they immediately look through their worldview. And so today, you talked about the 60s. And you talked about what was good that came out of the 60s, uh, uh, like civil rights, uh, but the things that, that were bad that came out of the 60s, the drug, sex, and rock and roll, right? Well, the rock and roll is debatable, all right? So, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you like the joke. I got him to laugh once. Look at that, yeah. <laughs> Get rid of those drums. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. All right, but anyway, but when it comes to whether it be like topics of racial reconciliation, abortion, 
uh, sexuality. You mentioned uh, even, even the huge debate that's going on and really some of the gut-wrenching realities of people, 14-year-olds, even younger than that, taking testosterone treatments. When we bring up these subjects, people tense up because they immediately look through the political lens. How can we talk about these things without people immediately making it a left-right thing? Oh, you can't. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm joking, kind of. I, I think that it's a, it's a tragedy because they sound political. I said that to a friend recently. He's like, you just always sound like you're just Mr. Right Wing. And I said, hey, talking about abortion, he was a Christian, so talking about abortion should not sound right wing. Right. If it does, then that's the problem. Right. The, we're supposed to be standing up for, for life, and that shouldn't be a right wing issue. Right. So the problem is, is that you're actually the one making it political, not me. And I would encourage people to understand that I think part of this is having to understand, in my opinion, this is just my humble opinion, that we have, we have to get used to the fact that some people are going to get mad at us that we are finally entering into a time where the words of Jesus are actually, tr in my mind, more true for me than, than they were 10 years ago. People are going to maybe hate me for what I believe. I remember growing up thinking, nobody's going to hate me in America. I mean, I might lose some friends. You know, I might get made fun of in, in the locker room because I haven't had sex because of my faith. We might get made fun of a little bit, but hating me? We might be moving to a time when people hate you. I think there's an issue of getting used to that fact and the fact that we shrink back, oh, it's going to sound political, but it's they're the ones looking through a political lens. And so I think that it's really not politics. You know, there's a famous saying that, that culture is upstream of politics. Culture is actually what moves politics to become you know, th through activism. It's the culture that needs to change. So I would say that that's part of it. I agree. I'm not looking for a fight. The last thing I want to do is start losing friends over this stuff. There may be some forms of disagreement. So what would you, you say? Know? What would you say? Because I 100% agree that we not looking for a fight doesn't mean we roll over to say, well, I just don't want to get into it. Sure. Right? Because some of these ideas are literally, I've never, your grandma at 93, well, I'm, I mean, I'm going to hit 40 this year, so she's got that on me, I guess. But I've never seen it. Even as a youth pastor, I've never seen this. I can't imagine doing youth ministry right now. It's a completely different beast in that sense, you know. Um, sorry, Will. He's our youth pastor now. He's doing a great job. Yeah. He was a, he was a man in you, too, if, so he's like, Oh, man. wow. Yeah. If so, any man wants yeah. to follow me, pick up your cross. Yeah. Pick up that youth worker cross. Good <laughs> gracious. So as far as uh, when we, we need to engage in this, we cannot yeah. be on the sidelines. And, and what I'm finding, especially with the media, and I love what you said this on, by the way, on your podcast. The media, I don't care what media it is, they're a bunch of liars. Can we yes. agree with that? Yeah. Right? Um, and so they really, they want your heart, they want your narrative, yeah. and, and one of the things is, is that if you aren't going to toe the line, they need to go on the sidelines. And yeah. we as believers need to contend with the truth. How do you do that without being that combative monster? Mm. There's a couple things I think I'd like to point out if you guys, if I got, if I got yeah. the time. Number one, I want to point out to people who actually, if you actually care, some people might be like, man, I don't really care about this stuff. What I think, we, are you guys going to talk about social justice? Or um, you don't? If we're going to talk about a whole slew of okay. topics. Okay, let so, me yeah. just say yeah. this. The ideological social justice movement that we hear so much about, they do not use terminology the way we use terminology. Right. And so a lot of Christians think they are fighting for something just when they're really not. They're fighting for things that, for instance, under, I just want everybody to understand this, under social justice, it is, it is justice to make sure that we put more abortion clinics in black neighborhoods, to make sure that they have more access, and frankly, to make sure that more minority children are slaughtered. This is the way I, this is... From everything I've read, that's what I understand. The fact that they don't have equal access is injustice. There's a lot of Christians being like, reproductive justice. That's what reproductive justice means. You are standing up and fighting to have more abortion clinics in minority neighborhoods. There's all sorts of things. I already mentioned. It's justice to make sure that 14-year-old girls can have double hysterectomy surgery paid for by insurance. Parents, parents aren't going to be allowed to even have anything to do with this. 
That is not something we would call justice under, uh, under right. uh, the Bible. I could go on about this for an hour. The social justice movement, the poor and the oppressed, is not what we think that it means. So Christians are getting sucked into it because they think it's love. When, it, in my view, I believe it's hate. I believe that Jesus defines love. And I don't think that Jesus would be out there saying, more black and brown babies murdered. I don't think he'd be doing that. It's hate. So we need to understand what we are supporting. Don't be the first one jumping on a bandwagon because you want a virtue signal to something. I would just want to yeah. really clarify that. Other than that, I'm not saying you need to jump on and start yelling at folks, but I do think having dialogue with brothers and sisters in a, in a hopefully a loving way is really, really important to do. So unfortunately, I hate to say this, but I heard somebody say it recently. Well, I won't say it. It just takes too long to say it. But basically, we are going to have to do a little bit more education to understand the world, the world that we're in. And I know that, that a lot of people are like, oh, I don't really know if I want to do that. But I promise you, if you do, and, and you're committed to the Bible, your love for Christ is going to grow immensely because you will see the truth of the word is so light compared to how dark. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can't imagine because what I hear you saying is there's a lot of words that, are, that we would agree with, like uh, social justice, that word like we want justice. Yes, we want that. Racial reconciliation. We want that. You know, we, we are for the sanctity of life. We want that. But people are taking words and they're redefining them and going completely opposite directions. Yes. Now, uh, as far as, uh, by the way, he, he's going to have books that you're going to be able to buy out in the, uh, lo uh, the lobby. We have a few, so we'll see how many we have. Uh, but uh, one, one of the things in your books you talk about is just when you went to college. Um, and I, it brought me back when I was in college 20 years ago, uh, more than that now. Uh, I was in a psychology class, and uh, yeah, psychology class, and literally they would chastise you immediately for being a Christian, and they would chastise you and saying all these different things. How could you be so foolish? And it, it kind of threw me for a loop for a little bit. I was I wasn't even going to be a pastor at the time; I was going to be a meteorologist, and uh, and so I went and studied hard. Uh, nerd and, alert! Yeah, nerd alert! I know. Yeah, yeah. For Christmas, I got a weather station. You're going to be able to log into it and see. Never mind. All right, so. Uh, through AccuWeather. Okay, I just outed myself. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm oppressing yeah. him. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, but uh, as far as in that season, I dove into a book called The Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. That was my influence that really apologetics made me understand why I believe, why the grass was green. Oh, okay. It's green because of uh, photosynthesis, right? Am I right on that? Yeah. Okay, good. I haven't been in biology for a long time. All right. So anyway, uh, but uh, and, yeah, anyway. All right, so, but as far as that, who are some of your influences right now that are helping you just articulate in the, in, when you're having conversations with people? Well, I wasn't ready for that question. You caught me. I never I did get I catch stumped. You, you, oh, you stumped me. Well, I do think uh, there are some, some modern things to listen to. I, and the reason I say that is because sometimes if, if you're intellectual, you can read some of the older books, mm -hmm. and, and which are brilliant, brilliant people, uh, like you're talking about. And you can say, oh, that's kind of the same argument as now. Francis Schaeffer. Yes. Francis Schaeffer is, is just as relevant today as, as 50 years ago. But there are people now modern putting it in kind of like the parlance of the times, dealing with some of the new language of your truth and this and the other. So there are some wonderful podcasts that people can listen to. Some of those would be, um, if you want to write it down, you can write it down. There's a podcast called Just Thinking, and they are uh, two great Christian men, uh, and they're actually guests on my podcast, which comes out tomorrow. They were guests. We talked right. about race, the fact that we are all one race in Christ. We are all one body in Christ, no matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like. It's beautiful, right? The gospel is so wonderful. Just Thinking podcast, um, The Dividing Line, uh, James White has got a great podcast. Other than that, there are some wonderful apologetics available from Ravi Zacharias um, that is also modern. Um, if you want something more academic, Francis Schaeffer was quite academic, but, but yeah. brilliant. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad I stumped you, too. You did stump me, but now okay. I'm ready in case you ask me the yes. next time. All right, so we are in extra innings, but can I do one more question? Church? Okay, all right, all right. So, real quick, um, I want to just make this personal here. Um, I have never, you know, in the scripture where, where uh, 
Paul talks about the people shipwrecking their faith. He even says, in the latter days, there'll be people, even the elect, uh, if possible, the elect, abandoning the faith. And I am seeing that at a rapid, rapid rate. It may be because we've placed our faith into politics, which we should never have done, or, or we've placed our faith into a, a, a way of thinking. I don't know. Whatever it is, and I think you've articulated it well today, what do you say to the person that has begun their process of deconstructing, meaning they are stepping back from orthodoxy? And then I have a follow-up question that when you're done. You know, I have a real warning for, for everybody, and I hope that you, this makes sense. I would say this. Beware of what I call Bible plus theology. Bible plus theology says this, that the Bible is not sufficient to answer every question of my day. The Bible is not sufficient to answer all of my needs. Yeah, but my mom died from cancer, and I, I need to see what someone does. The Bible can answer that. Who do I vote for? The Bible can answer that. What do I have to believe about so-and-so brand new issue? The Bible can answer that. The Bible is sufficient for it. I'm not saying not to read other stuff. What has happened in deconstruction, people think that they are becoming a blank slate, the idea of deconstruction in Christianity is I'm going to become a blank slate. I don't want to know what my pastor thinks. I don't know what my parents think. I don't want to know what my friends think. I don't know what Francis Schaeffer and all those theologians and Ravi Zacharias. They're all trying to brainwash me. I'm going to become a blank slate, take in all of the information, and start all over again. It is an impossibility to become a blank slate. Right? We are in the flesh. The flesh wants you to sin. The flesh wants to kill you. The flesh wants to render you ineffective for the kingdom of God. The flesh is at enmity against God at all times. You are not going to become a blank slate. Come on, start preaching. So what I would say is this. You have a lot of people that say, I'm going to become a blank slate. I'm going to read the Bible plus psychology. I'm going to read the Bible plus Darwin's evolution. I'm going to read the Bible plus social justice movement. Bible plus fill in the blank. And what it takes you to, all of those things have their own worldviews that are different than, the, than this worldview. Because the idea is that Jesus is not actually sufficient to meet all of your needs. Now you have split lordship between Christ and psychology or fill in the blank. Now, people that have expressed to me, well, over the years, well, I'm taking a step back. I'm now the popular words deconstructing. I'm I don't know what I think of this doctrine of the virgin birth or, you know, I just can't go to the church because the sexual ethic are different or you, you can fill in the blank. And usually what I find is a person that's in that process, it didn't happen one morning like, boom, I think I'm going to wake up and I'm going to step away from Christ. Usually it's a podcast, it's a, it's a mentor, even uh, in, a, in a, uh, another book that's really good, it's not here today for sale, but it's called Another Gospel. We, you had her on your podcast or you were on her back, what's her name again? Uh, Alyssa Childers. Alyssa Childers, okay. And, um, I read her book, forgot her name. But anyway, she talked. She actually deconstructed and then stepped back into the things of God. Um, but it was actually a pastor that, that wooed her away from Jesus. Uh, he was a, a, a secret practical atheist, uh, and so or agnostic. And so, again, I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I, just, I listen to this podcast or I read this book. It's, it, it's not really affecting me. I'm coming up with these things. Yeah. Do you see the, the link between what they're listening to and who they're following in their deconstruction? That's very, very important. Do you hear that? Kind of what you're saying is, is that they act like they become a blank slate. Right. But they're putting garbage in. Yes. You're not actually a blank slate. It's exactly what Eve did, right? Eve is doing fine. Then the, the, if she, the servant comes up and says whatever, what if she's like, I just want to be a blank slate and consider what the devil has to say. Let's just to see how it goes. She would have been better to not listen to the serpent in the first place. So we have this idea of I'm a blank slate and I can handle what these people have to say all on my own. And then you start taking garbage in. And guess what happens when the devil starts feeding your flesh what your flesh actually is hungry for? Come on, honey. I'm preaching, aren't I? When, you, when the <laughs> devil starts giving you exactly what you want for the meal, you start loving it. And you're like, you know, and I just want to, that's, that's what it's like. What if you were in a marriage? I'm serious. What if you're in a marriage where you said, you, 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 I said to my wife, I love you with all of my heart, but you need to understand, I, I can't actually only uh, be faithful to you. I have to have other sexual relationships. It's not that I don't love you, but I have to have these things. Is that something that she's going to handle? What if I said, okay, fine, I will have other sexual relationships, but I do need 
to watch certain things that are sexual in nature, pornographic. Is that okay? She's not going to be okay with that. Well, what if I just look at other women? That, that's not what it means to make a covenant. I know I'm off on a tangent, but that's kind of what it's like. When we commit idolatry, the Bible says idolatry is spiritual adultery. It is the same thing. So literally people that are maybe taking in and almost bowing down to the podcast or their books or even mentors, they're committing adultery even in that. Uh, in my view, yes. You are okay. listening to, to the voice of another that you need to not be listening to. It's the height of, of it's the opposite of wisdom. It's foolishness. It's absolute foolishness to listen to the devil and just see, you know, I'm going to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, foolishness. Stay away from it. Yeah, well, um, that's all the questions I have. But it, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to pray you out. Because I believe when I heard this first podcast uh, about, what, a year and a half ago now? And it was an, actually after a major Christian author, I think right around that time you started talking, he deconstructed and and stepped away. Now he's an atheist. He's a guy that I read many of his books while I was growing up. It was a, he wrote, it was a, well, it's pretty public now, but he wrote books on dating and things like that. And now he's, uh, you did your first uh, podcast around that time. And I thought, you know what? This really felt like the Lord even speaking. God is using you as a voice for such a moment as this. And what I'd like to do is to end this service today. If we can just pray over uh, John, just as I believe his voice is going to be one that resounds and really uh, strikes where the iron's hot conversations all around this country. So let's pray for him, church. Father, we thank you so much for John. Uh, we just thank you for his whole family. Thank you for Corey. Uh, God, we just uh, thank you for their ministry through Skillet. Uh, God, we pray that he can get back in the stadiums and, and, and through uh, the entertaining uh, people in the arenas. God, we know what it's all about. It's about actually leading people to Christ. We thank you for that. But God, these new doors that have opened during COVID, uh, God, you have, you have opened up so many doors for people to uh, hear uh, the voice that you're speaking through John. Uh, and God, I just pray that you'd give him uh, the mind and the eyes to see uh, with your articulation uh, of how to respond to what's going on in culture. So God, we pray for increased favor over his podcast, increased favor uh, over his book, uh, and increased favor over his influence on people that are legitimately struggling in the faith right now. We pray the tide will turn in 2021. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give it up for John, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. Out in the lobby, John will be out there. There will also be a number of books if you want to buy his book. I've read it. Uh, cover to cover, it's great. Hey, next week will be part two of In God We Trust. We're going to talk about authority. We're going to talk about how we can trust the Bible and amongst other authorities that are speaking into our life. We'll see you next week. Thanks for going to the extra innings. Goodbye. As a church, it is our honor to be a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life, and we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out what your next steps could be in your relationship with Jesus, all you have to do is go to kenosha.church slash next steps. Thanks again for visiting us online today.